2015 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, this meeting is being recorded by ACMI. <clears throat> First on our agenda this evening is a discussion of an open meeting law complaint filed by a resident of the town um, alleging a couple of different violations and I wanted to have a quick discussion about our response to that. First, I'll give you a chance to get settled and okay. Mike, we wanted to start. Um, so I've, I've read the, the form of complaint, and, uh, and I think uh, I think we discussed a little bit the uh, the last meeting uh, a request that had come in, and uh, I think like I did a couple weeks ago when we had that discussion that uh, our decisions were right around uh, correct around what we had done, uh, and um, beyond that I would also. Uh, Suggest that it's the type of thing that uh, we should um, present uh, uh, the different defenses that are afforded to us uh, with respect to it. So any of them that, that might be applicable. Mm -hmm. So that's my idea. Did you have anything? No, I don't. Bruce? Yeah, I would add um, for people who are unfamiliar with it, uh, it, it uh, the complaint alleges that. A question posed by a member in the audience wasn't recorded in the minutes, and uh, the board has previously re reviewed its minutes, and the minutes, in our opinion, accurately reflect the, uh, the the substance of what was discussed that night and how the board reached its decision. And um, it's important to understand that minutes are not a transcript, so right. not every question finds its way into the minutes. Um, so for that reason, I concur with uh, my care that um, we don't need to uh, amend the minutes, uh, and um, I would uh, move that we authorize town council to file a response on our behalf with the attorney general's office uh, with respect to those allegations, uh, and pursue all the procedural and substantive uh, uh, avenues that are open to us. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Next up is the tree committee. With some tree protection issues. And we have several members of the tree committee here this evening, so I ask them to come up and have a seat and introduce themselves. Name and address, please. My name is Mary Ellen Arano, 22 Addison Street in Arlington. Um, I'm the co-chair of the Arlington Tree Committee, and um, um, the committee uh, is a board of selectmen appointed. We work together and alongside the DPW Tree Department to um, promote the protection, planting, and care of trees in Arlington. Representatives from the committee are here tonight to discuss the urgent need to regulate the removal of trees on private property during development. The tree committee was recently approached at one of our open public meetings by some concerned residents. And as is protocol for our committee, we um, put together a subcommittee to research um, issues like this um, in more detail. And with that, I'm going to introduce Susan Stamps, who is um, leading up the subcommittee on, on, on this issue. Okay, Susan Stamps. What am I supposed to say? 30, Susan Stamp, 39 Grafton Street, Tree Committee. Um, so this resident came to our, our Tree Committee meeting in February, uh, was very concerned that his uh, formerly beautiful leafy neighborhood was sort of a wasteland after a lot of trees were cut down um, in the course of a demolition and rebuild on the property. And wondered, what, did the town have any way of stopping this sort of thing? And um, that it, he had done, he had come prepared, he had done a lot of research around the country and found that there are a lot of communities around the country that regulate the removal of trees on private property as part of the, the permitting process. And, uh, and we, it just so happened that um, Mike Rademacher was at that meeting and we asked him what, 
because the tree warden works out of his, out of the DPW, and asked, and he said as far as he knew, there was no protection at all. There's nobody, there wasn't, nobody was tasked with uh, worrying about what was going on with trees on the property. So um, we, we all, it was an issue that came up in the master planning process. We, um, some of us went to the master planning meetings and um, specifically I went to the one for town meeting members. I brought it up um, because it had, um, as I had sent you guys this memo, mm -hmm. and I, by the way, I have hard copies, it's been very organized. Um, I have copies of the memorandum that I sent you that okay. state the issues. Anybody need I'll one? Say. Did you get it? Got it. Okay. Got it. And also, this morning, I, there was a memorandum with the benefits of trees, which I left out of the original memorandum. I don't know if you guys got that. That was well, yeah. Okay. And then the Lexington tree bylaw. And everybody got that. Yeah. So anyway, we we um, the master planning process identified removal of trees on private property as an issue. Um, and as I point out in my memorandum, it, it speaks so, in several places to the importance of trees in the community for many reasons. And that um, a medium-term goal would be to look into regulation of removal of trees on, on property, private property. The tree committee feels that um, this is an immediate and urgent goal, and that it's really too bad that we don't have any regulations in place now, and that that we'd like to work with the the, the board and the planning department with all deliberate speed to get a bylaw before next um, spring's town meeting. The town of Lexington has a really good bylaw; we like it a lot. Um, the it basically, what the, the very, um, Cambridge regulates the removal of trees on private property, um, Newton does, Brookline has some protections, um, the town of Weston just passed some protections, Wellesley's looking into it, Needham is looking into <coughs> it. Um, so it's happening in communities that are getting alarmed that developers are coming in and taking down all the trees. And there certainly is lots of precedent, I don't have to tell you this, for, for a municipality regulating what people do on their private property that's going to affect the, the neighborhood, which obviously whole, wholesale removal of trees does. So um, we, in Lexington, the tree committee is, is a much stronger board. It actually, if somebody doesn't like what the tree warden has told them they can do in the course of their, their um, rebuild, they can appeal it to the tree committee, et cetera. And, but all of these towns, mo most of the towns that we've researched, it's not um, me going out and removing that tree that's too close to my house or a tree that I don't like. It is um, only in the context of um, major construction or a complete rebuild, number one. And number two, it's only within a certain setback, like in Lexington, it's um, within 30 feet from the, from the front of the, the, the lot and 15 feet from the side and the back. So um, I know that it's a, the setback issue is a huge challenge in Arlington because I, I don't know, I, I'm sure it, it, the zoning map makes my head spin, and I think there are set, different setbacks all over the place. But none of these problems are insurmountable, and I, I hope that the board will agree that this needs to happen. And we, there are many people here tonight who want to talk about what um, clear cutting of trees has, in the course of construction, has done in their neighborhoods, and it's increasing in town, and it's a really urgent issue. So, um, it. With the board's permission, you could maybe hear from some residents, or if you have some questions first, or whatever you want to do. We'll begin with questions. So, do you uh, foresee that this would be a zoning bylaw or yes. a general bylaw? Well, you know, it's interesting. Laura Weiner, um, I talked to the other day. She looked at the Lexington bylaw, and she felt that it had um, it, um, the characteristics of both. Maybe Carol can speak to that. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I really don't know anything about zoning. 
generally zoning um, regulates uh, well land use, but also you know we think of it more as the built you know man-made built environment. Okay. Um, we we get into these types of issues if we have a special permit that requires environmental design review, and then we're looking at things like you know landscape plan and so on. Um, but for the most part, I don't really think the zoning bylaw, there's nothing analogous that I can think of in the zoning bylaw that would be similar to this. So it may be that uh, what we're talking about is a general bylaw, which would have to, um, but, uh, and so I, I, I thumbed through the Lexington uh, bylaw that you gave as an example. This would not necessarily be what you're proposing, it's just a, it's a model, is that right? It, it's a model, um, just, you know, the idea of, you're not telling everybody they can't take down one or two trees. You're only talking about um, within a limited area where clearly it would affect the neighborhood, and that's some, somewhere within a setback, and and it's only in the context of, of major reconstruction, which is where, frankly, you usually see it. Mm -hmm. um, and it also talks about trees that are of a certain caliber, the, in other words, the diameter of the tree, and they're, they apply to eight inches or greater in the Lexington bylaw. Um, Newton had, does it. Everybody does it slightly differently. Right. Yeah. And I noticed there was uh, certain unprotected trees, so mm -hmm. aggressive uh, species or, or yes. invasive species right. wouldn't necessarily yeah. escape the, yeah. the saw. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing that, that I, I don't know if I mentioned this, in this but there's something called, that the master plan called, um, um, not only a tree by law, but, oh, a neighborhood conservation districts. Carol knows something about that, I think. But the other one that I forgot to mention in here is a scenic road by law. I don't know if you guys know anything about scenic roads, but it's a state program, and you can designate certain roads. And I'm sure there's lots of roads in um, Arlington you could designate as a, a, a scenic road. And then you're not really regulating removal of trees on private property, but you're protecting them on public property. And that's a whole different topic. That that's not really what we're here to address today. Mm -hmm. um, but there's not a whole lot of protection if the an individual can't remove a tree on public property, like, you know, the tree strip or anything. But if the town decides that they want to, they're basically the, the final decision maker. There's no process for the town, and I think ultimately we, we want a process for the town also. I'm not accusing the town of taking down trees in a bad way, but um, towns often do this, and that's where scenic roads are helpful. Uh, yeah, I think I, I can see where Bruce is coming from as far as this being a, 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 in the regular bylaw versus the zoning bylaw. I think yeah. that, you know, um, I'm not sure if this place belongs here. I, I guess a couple things I'd point out is going through the Lexington um, bylaw. Um, first off, they talk about a tree manual. So, so I think that what you're talking about is I don't know what's in a tree manual, but um, is I, it a pamphlet? Is it yeah, a book? Me. Is it a because just a just a kind of just it seems to me that there's a good deal of work to do uh, on this, unless I'm missing something. You, you really we don't need to come up with a tree manual first. What, what Lexington did was that they had some amazing group of people in Lexington who not only helped fashion the relevant bylaws, but they also did this whole tree manual, only a very tiny portion of which is actually the bylaw, and the rest of it is um, guidelines for homeowners to take care of their trees and guidelines for the town for what they should do, so I really wouldn't get, that's really not relevant, the tree manual. It's okay, not at all but what it, we're it, about. it might be from a, uh, digestion standpoint because what's a good tree what's a bad tree who's gonna say what's gonna you know all that all those types of things right I mean I, I'm just thinking about the bylaw and being a town meeting member and what questions are you know likely to come up and I think this this has the um, potential to be um, quite controversial and um, I think if ducks aren't in a row 
that regardless of whether it's a zoning bylaw or otherwise, just my own view is is um, that it has challenges. And you know, frankly, I think the other thing as I as I think about Lexington, driving down Lowell Street quite often, um, you know, they've got quite a few houses that have gone up on Lowell Street. This went into place 2001. It's been clear cut of several lots. So I, I think I'm curious if if all of that was done in Lexington with this bylaw here, what protections are you really affording anything? And are they are they real protections or are we just kidding ourselves to some extent? Because I mean, a lot of those lots have been cleared um, uh, quite a bit, um, unless I'm mistaken. Um, the other thing is, is as I look at even these pictures, you know, I think it's an eight-inch tree, um, if I'm not mistaken, that is uh, protected. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking at this picture down here. It doesn't look like a whole lot of eight-inch trees are there. I mean, so I might be mistaken in that. And up here, the angle's a little different on each, but frankly, that big tree's still there, that big tree, that big tree. A lot of the big trees are still there. So... Uh, I guess, once again, I'm coming from a place of <laughs> knowing how this is going to go over, um, that, you know, I, I think there's some work to be done on, um, on positioning and uh, figuring out what it is that, that should be done Absolutely. This is a preliminary discussion. Uh, we felt that it's not, it's never too early to start the no, conversation. No, I agree with that. I agree and completely. And we, we absolutely appreciate that feedback. Yeah, I just, I see a lot of challenges with this, and I think, as I look at the, and I'm sure folks have war stories, I, I can only imagine, I'm, I'm sorry for those, but I'm not, you know, I haven't, I'm not sure that this necessarily articulates it maybe as, as well as you might hope, so. May I just add yeah, please. I, I'm Sally Nash. I'm on Five Old Colony Road. Okay. And um, I see your point about these, these pictures. Um, I'm quite familiar with yep. quite a few of these sites because the, the older road is in my neighborhood. Okay. Um, and the discrepancy that you're seeing in that upper photo for Oldham Road, but eight Oldham Road, um, what it doesn't really illustrate is that there are trees existing on neighboring properties behind. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually the density of the trees that has been lost. So the, the ones in the foreground that are on the actual property have gone. So you can see from left to right that the, mm -hmm. the tree cover is actually thinner yep. on the right. Yep. Um, the other point that I would make, if you look at 27 Oldham Road. Yeah, that certainly looks like quite a bit of, of stuff was Indeed. done there. That's yeah. why I wasn't uh, picking on those particular ones right. because that was obviously fairly clear cut. So there were something like 13 trees taken mm. down and yep. some of the stumps were sitting at the side of the road and they were you know, the sides. Mm -hmm. So they were definitely very mature trees. Yep. Um, other locations around the neighborhood that I have been looking at have had similar size trees taken down. So And some of them, interestingly enough, seem to be within the uh, tree strip. Or at least... Okay. The, the, you know, sort of well, but there's tree. already a thing, but, and what you'll hear is... is you're not allowed to do that. Right. So that that's that's a whole different right. ball of wax. Right. So I'm curious I think, to know if they got permission. So so yeah, and and I think that's a great question to ask the right the right parties. Right. So, um, but once again, I appreciate you bringing it up so early. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to to discuss and that type of thing. Uh, I do think it has some some challenges along the way. So. No, I kind of agree with this group. I mean, I think it. That it really matters, the trees in this town. It's what makes the street feel great. It's one of the nicest things in Arlington is the trees. And um, if there's a practical way, and I appreciate the start you made, to figure out a way that it could be made into a bylaw, maybe it has to do with setback and new construction, that consideration has to be given for large trees that are close to the street. Um, and then they're beholden in some way, if you're in new construction, to recognize that and put that as part of your permit application. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to it because it's, it's too early, but um, that, that's all. I, I think it's a great idea because it matters so much to the way uh, the streets feel. So I'm looking, searching, maybe as others are, is to figure out really what's practical to, to go forward with. But I'd love to hear from the 
audience too. So that's all. I don't have much more to say than that at this point. Yeah. I don't have anything additional to add. I think I can agree with Andy. Said it pretty well. I'm happy to take a couple of comments. But I ask that you keep them brief. Um, State your name and address and stand up to speak. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Laura Berkey and I live at 15 Lakeview Street um, in Arlington. And I've, we've been there for five years, and previous to that, we lived down on Lombard Terrace. Um, we live next to 17 Lakeview Street, which was the home of uh, John Fitzmorris, who passed away a year ago. And his family um, sold the property to a developer from out of town um, who renovated the house, um, clear cut the hillside behind the house, erected two large cement walls, um, and has built uh, a, a very large house in the side yard. Um, so, um, so the retaining, these big, huge retaining walls were built where the trees were clear cut from this hillside. We went back and counted about 40 stumps. There, there it was egregious cutting of the hillside. Um, these trees were mature, they were healthy. I even had the, the arborist say to me, I'm so sorry I'm cutting these down. These are healthy, mature trees. Um, they screened the noise from Route 2. They provided shade, fresh air. Um, <coughs> and made a beautiful lane um, in Spring Valley. I invite you to come down and take a look at it. Um, and they secured the hillside. Um, I want to add to um, her remarks. Uh, I was recently uh, about regulations in different towns. I was visiting <coughs> in Virginia, and in where I was staying in Virginia, you can't just cut down the trees. You have to get a permit. A friend of mine lives in Maryland, same thing. You can't just take down trees. Um, and I also want to add that the Tree Committee website has a lot of information. It might be somewhat similar to the Lexington Manual. Um, so I would, um, I would urge you to have some kind of regulation in town. What has happened on Spring Valley is a travesty. It is really, um, really upsetting. And a number of those are photos from, my, from, the, from where I live. Thank you. I had a footnote. <clears throat> Alice Jardine. I live at 21 Spring Valley. I'm going to pass around a before and after picture. Lovely, leafy, shady lane, the last one as far as I can tell, to Spy Pond in Arlington. We heard the saws. This is after with all the ugly retaining walls. You can take a look if you want. Um, we heard the saws in the fall, and I think it was more like 100 trees. They basically strip cut the entire hillside, put up these ugly cement walls. It's right off of my porch. so. I'm obviously a property owner very deeply concerned about the fact that I now have a quasi-McMansion and these ugly cement retaining walls where there used to be a um, hundred or so trees on this leafy lane. But I think what I was most upset about, actually, this is a historical lane. It's where one of the first battles of the Re American Revolution took place. It's where the first um, British soldiers um, gave up and all the horses from that battle are buried there. It's where Ralph Alt Waldo Emerson wandered down Spring Valley to the lane, et cetera, et cetera. I know we don't have a lot of time. It's a historical treasure, and it is now trashed. It is completely trashed. And I personally went to the town. I went, the permits were in order. It was more than 100 feet from Spy Pond. Everything was in order. Everything was within the law, except that this 28-year-old kid from Revere had no idea that this was a treasured lane. And I urge you to go take a look at what is there now. It is a monstrosity. It is ugly. And this refuge was destroyed. And there are probably, there are tens of people who aren't here who are as upset as we are about this. And I urge the town, I've lived here 25 years, and I urge you to look at this, take it seriously. And, and try to come up with a, a solution. I understand how complicated it is. Thank you. I am Deanne DuPont, 32 Oldham Road, and I've been a resident since 1991. And I took those pictures of those more than 13 trees being removed from my living room. And I'm taking the approach more than I love the aesthetics and everything else, 
but removing trees and adding a larger footprint that displaces more water means that there's less water absorption. The town already has a problem with not sufficient water absorption. I've gone to several of these meetings by the town where they talk about problems with rainwater and, and water runoff, yet it seems like the two parts of the town aren't talking to each other because you have larger footprints and non-permeable surfaces so you can't absorb the groundwater and then you remove the trees so that exacerbates the problem. And um, in the case of 27 Oldham Road, I would think somebody should talk to the house that's downhill from them because there's a lot of ledge in this area. And when they built the house next to me on a larger footprint, removed some trees and shrubs, then I had to spend over $10,000 to mitigate the water damage from that house and the removal of trees. And so the town is bearing the costs of this and the homeowners next to it bear the costs of larger footprints and the removal of trees. And we have no recourse because Everything was built in accordance to the zoning laws and everything. But I have to deal with water now and spend the money to mitigate the water. And I bet the person downhill from 27 Oldham Road is going to have water problems down the line. So, I, I mean, I love trees. I like the aesthetic. But it's more than just about the beauty. It's, it's costing the town money because there's more mitigation they have to do. And it's costing me as a resident and taxpayer, more money just to live in my house. So I'm taking it from a different perspective. So thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Englisher from Six Lantern Lane. I live about a, a block away from uh, uh, Deanna here. And um, the, the large mature trees in, in the Morningside neighborhood, uh, it's a, a really important characteristic of the neighborhood, and it was important to me in choosing to um, to buy a house in the neighborhood 17 years ago. And since then, I would count almost 20 homes have been either basically rebuilt, built or rebuilt, in within a two to three block radius. And as I've seen these houses being constructed in an already developed neighborhood, I've seen trees be cut down um, in a variety of ways, some clear cutting of lots, major trees. A lot of the places that we were talking about, we didn't have pictures of of all of them to, uh, uh, to bring. Uh, but uh, many of these mature trees have been cut down, and some of them are enormous. I mean, I'm, eight inches sounds small to me. I'm, I'm talking about really, really large trees that took a very long time to grow, and there's no way um, to replace them. And in some cases, this has been because um, there are some larger lots, and I think the zoning, uh, the zoning law we have, or, or the zoning uh, code that we have now, doesn't properly reflect the character of the neighborhood, and there are places where uh, two houses are going in, and the place of one, the lots are being split. And in those cases, they often lead to cutting down every tree on the lot to make that happen. Um, so in addition to that, we've lost shade trees on the street. We don't really have a tree strip on, on our streets. We don't have sidewalks. And uh, trees are being cut down all over the place for various reasons. And some existing homeowners are just cutting trees down. So I think what's happened is the whole character of our neighborhood is changing for the worse. And I think that part of what the zoning law is supposed to do is to protect the good aspects of the character of the neighborhood for the benefit of everybody, for the benefit of the town, and, and, and the benefit of existing residents and owners. And I feel if we don't act right away to have some kind of protection, it will really be too late. And I'm confident that, um, uh, that the uh, redevelopment board and the uh, planning department and residents working together can develop something that's fair and balanced and protects everybody's interests, protects property owners' rights of all kinds of property owners, people who live here now, people including developers, and people who are going to live here in the future. And I, I urge you to um, give consideration to how it can be done. Thank you. <coughs> Please. Um, I want to give some friendly encouragement to the tree group and maybe some advice if you are willing to take it. Um, I think first off, you have to figure out, do you have a zoning article or do you have a general bylaw article? If it's a zoning article, then you're in the right place. If it's a general bylaw, 
you're probably going to be dealing more with the Board of Selectmen. Um, to me, it sounds more like a general bylaw as opposed to a zoning bylaw, but you can study that and come to your own conclusion as to which avenue you want to pursue. If you were to try to model a bylaw based on the Lexington bylaw, I'm going to repeat what Mike said. I really think that the tree book, if that's what it's called, tree manual. Yeah. tree manual, it's essential because you don't want to get before a town meeting and have people critique the article by saying it's vague. We don't know which species are protected and which we can cut. So I think I would focus on on that manual at the same point that you're drafting your, your, your bylaw. You want to be able to present that as one. So when it comes up for debate at town meeting, people know it's a lot of work. I know. But, but, but you know, once people start saying it's vague, you're going to lose a lot of votes, in my opinion. I, then, don't, I don't see that we need to distinguish between this kind of tree and that. I don't think that that's key to getting some protection in place. Okay, but maybe you don't have the same... Yeah. Bylaw that the Lexington one yeah. is, yeah. but no. that one specifically excludes. You know, it makes I reference think. to the to the, the tree manual. So people are going to say, "Well, where is it?" And then the other thing that I would urge you to think about are what are the triggers on this. Uh, I think at one point it talks about trees that are in a setback, complete, uh, um, either raising of the structures or substantial new construction. But then it also gets into talking about the stem of the tree being in the setback. Mm -hmm. And the stem can be a long way away from the trunk. So all of a sudden you could be talking about a 60-foot setback instead of a 20-foot setback. So I urge you just to think about how expansive you want the article to be. So. And sorry, but I'm going to pile on on one thing. I understand that the tree manual is a lot of work. But in essence, you will be taking away someone's property right okay as you do this um and that is something other than parking <laughs> that might be the most controversial in this town um rightfully so because anytime the town takes that kind of action against people's property rights you should have a good accounting for it so i know it's a lot of work and and everything else but the, the fact is is if this is something that folks want to accomplish just as i said i'm piling on with bruce I do think it makes sense to get the work done. You're starting early, which is good, but I think without that, I, whether it's a zoning or a regular bylaw, I, I, I'm not sure I see success in the future otherwise. So, um, just my thought. I'm not aware of Newton or any of the other places we looked at having tree manuals. I, Lexington just went Cadillac on it, so. And, and maybe that's it. Maybe you can yeah. get the Newton one and, right. and check yeah. it out and everything. So, I'm not saying, I. I'm just saying, when you go up there, yep. you, you, you got to make But there's sure. a lot of things we tell people that they can't do on their private property. Agreed. The public good. Agreed, but absolutely. Yeah. But here, you're talking about building, and you're talking about, more importantly, not building. Okay? And that's when you really need to... No. Um, well, if you can't move a tree... If you, if you can't move a tree, then you might not be able to build or well, separate that lot. So the, the, Lexington, the Lexington bylaw specifically provides that if somebody, if the contractor really needs to move a tree, otherwise they can't build what they want to build, then they work with the, the town to figure out how it can be mitigated by replacing a tree you know, somewhere else. So there's a lot of flexibility in the bylaw. Okay, super. It's totally understandable. Nope. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just giving yeah. you my sense of yep. what's bound to happen. Yep. So it's I mean, we've all lived it. Like so. It. <laughs> so anyway. good. Well, thank you. Okay. For coming in. Thank I appreciate you it. Right. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thank you.
give us an update as to the design standards. Please come up, have a seat, introduce yourself, even though I've already done it. For you. <laughs> Good evening, I'm David Gamble. I'm an architect and an urban planner with Gamble Associates. We're based in Cambridge. Uh, I uh, am working with the town on developing a set of design standards. <coughs> I was also a sub-consultant to RKG on the uh, master plan, so I've had some engagement with the public, primarily through a visual preference survey last summer. And uh, I think I met with you maybe six or eight weeks ago. So we are on a very accelerated time frame. And I know the document that you received, you just got on Friday, so I apologize for late notice, but what I thought I could do is try to highlight, uh, to use your time most effectively, a couple of things. One is, is we'd like to get some acknowledgement or some feedback on the structure of the standards, which are very Arlington specific with the notion of these three corridors. We think that, that could be uh, very unique amongst uh, towns because it's, it's seldom that you have these three intersecting uh, alignments. Each of one has a different requirement in some way or should have a different requirement in terms of build out. So we'd, we'd like to get your feedback on that as a structure. We did do a test case development scenario based on these standards for a site which is, I think, vulnerable or poised for redevelopment, the Walgreens site between Spy Pond and Mass Ave. We just chose it, but it's not for sale or anything, but it actually intersects two of the three corridors, so we, you haven't seen that yet, but I have a handout to walk you through uh, what could happen on that site if it were to be redeveloped following these guidelines, and more than anything else to try to give you a sense of capacity and what some overarching urban design principles are. So that's an application of the standards to a very specific site, and I'd like to get your feedback on that. And third, we, we we are, as I said, having working under a fairly accelerated time frame. Uh, we're going to have a public meeting two weeks from tonight, and it would be great to get your thoughts on how we might use that most effectively. Uh, you guys are in the trenches uh, week after week, so I think you probably have your fingertips on the pulse of, of the issues that will likely come up, so it would be good to get your feedback on that. Uh, so I, I think you have that handout. This is uh, a draft. We're going to have two deliverables, one which is a document that uh, the town will, will get for the standards, and another thing is a, I don't have the right term for it, it's a poster, it's a, it's a, uh, it's some type of graphic device, this is one we did for a nearby town, that if a developer was proposing to do something, mm -hmm. and she wanted to know what are the, what are the essential criteria, uh, look at this, mm -hmm. and so we're, we're, we're we're in the process, we haven't yet done it, but we're, we would like to create something like this. It might be a 11 by 17, it doesn't have to be a poster, but we'd like to create something that's easy, easily digestible, uh, highly graphic, uh, written for the layman, um, something that deciphers, you know, as, as the people at the last meeting talked about, the zoning is often very cumbersome and hard to, to, to digest. So we see this as a as a, as a simplification of, of the booklet, um, something that can be printed in-house if it's a smaller format. And if, again, this is for a nearby town, so it's, it's not specific to Arlington, but we would custom tailor it. Yeah. Uh, so the, the structure, the, uh, the test case, and when you're ready, I can hand that out, and then the, uh, the notion of, a, of the public meeting. I don't want to inundate you with too much no, paper no, no, <laughs> to start no, with. No, no, I, I don't know, uh, Carol, were there other things that you, um, you would like us to, uh, to address in the limited time we have? Uh, no, I just think this is a, um, I think you're on track with trying to get feedback on the structure, but also um, want to make sure the board feels that what's included eventually in the content is going to help, particularly with um, redevelopment of mixed use sites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did, I did prime the pump by asking you uh, a very specific question under these seven themes uh, that we'd like to structure the deal with. First and foremost, uh, 
the building setbacks, um, in which case, uh, on page 8 from, uh, from Friday's handout, asking whether or not the greatest setbacks should be reserved for Millbrook, then the bikeway, and the development along Mass Ave and Broadway should actually be almost a no-build scenario. Yes. Andrew, can I ask a question? Yes. Before you get going, what, yeah. what is the, the Mass Ave and Broadway are two streets, right? Those are corridors? Yes. Those are two? Yes. Two separate ones. Right? But we're treating them similarly. Well, they flow into okay, each other. So they're, the they're three he's talking about are these three. We, okay. we did combine Mass Ave and Broadway knowing that they no are problem. different, slightly different. So animals. then Minuteman Bikeway, I get, right? That's, what's, and I'm the big Millbrook corridor guy, and I don't know <coughs> what it is. We have, a, we have identified the Millbrook study area. That I know. And I think generally speaking, that's what we're talking about. So it would help it to have a map, a map yeah. right at the beginning of this thing. Yeah. And the dotted line around each guy. Yeah. And because the one that's hardest to understand is the Millbrook corridor. And I found it hard to figure out because it's, it's both Mass Ave and Summer Street and the Millbrook and the Millbrook, mm -hmm. all three. And it's hard to say, well, what am I setting back from? Am I setting back from Mass Ave? Am I setting back from the Brook? Am I setting back from Summer Street? Mm -hmm. That one's the one that really got my okay. head scratching, trying to figure out what, how it fit into this formula. Yeah. And I see you're trying to fit it in here, and it's not easy. It's not easy, and I think that there's one site, the uh, Mirac site, where they, the three corridors are sufficiently spaced far enough apart that it, it's it's easier for a person to delaminate. Yeah. When they start to intermingle, it becomes more complex. You're absolutely right. But if it's a if it's a Mirac site, how would you how would you define it? Because it's like it is so deep. So you're saying you would apply Mass Ave corridor to that, and then something else to the rest of it. The most important dimension is actually the build two line or the setback line. And so the way that we're imagining is that it's the Mass Ave dimension where this, where any future development faces that corridor. Yeah. The Millburg would have two sides to it, and the, the bikeway would have one because it's essentially bounded by, the north side would be bounded by the bike path. So the Millbrook corridor, I mean, I guess to start defining it is the best thing for me to understand. It's a big chunk of land, right? It has streets running through it, sometimes bordering it. So it just doesn't act like Broadway or Mass Ave. Moreover, it's covered up in substantial portions, so right. it's not even yeah. there. Whereas the mill, whereas the bike path, right? The Minuteman bikeway, that's, that's defined in a way because it's a public park. Basically, it's a linear public park. And I want to stop anything. I want to do the best things we can around it. But it's more defined because I can kind of identify what it is. It's a, a line. Yeah. The other one's a chunk, mm -hmm. a big chunk that goes through lots of streets, and it's almost like it's not in. It's it's hard to put it in this category, or it has to be given another category. I, okay. I actually agree with that, especially if you look at page eleven, where you talk about just building height. And I don't mean to skip ahead, but it, it's it's kind of part and parcel. You know. To me, this is a little bit scary, right? Uh, first off, uh, height to five stories. I think that's great, but I think that folks aren't used to that here in Arlington necessarily. <laughs> so I think that whatever sample you have might be a good uh, good way to look at it. But I think uh, the building in, in the center is four on mm -hmm. all the kind of Palladium windows there or yes, whatever else. Yes, it is. Yep. Um, so you're talking about something, another story about that. Yes. But but that's, I think that's neither here or there. I think we can easily, as long as you're kind of putting buildings of different height, I think actually it would be pretty neat. Um, but then I look at the Minuteman bikeway and the Millbrook corridor, and you say three to five stories on the Minuteman bikeway, and you say two, uh, two and four stories on the Millbrook corridor. You know, I guess when we're talking about Myrac and that type of thing that does hit both, then maybe it makes sense to have those conversations but I'm thinking about kind of Millbrook along, along the way, 
and I guess other than the condo complexes, which do rise pretty high, you know, we, things are pretty pretty low there. And I think that when you have that public meeting, rightfully so, I think you're going to get an earful on how dense you're trying to make two places that aren't dense now necessarily. Um, so, to me. It is about Mass Ave and Broadway, and then these other pieces, as they relate to Mass Ave and Broadway, I think that's where this starts to make more sense, uh, where they maybe don't intersect as much as get close or property goes from one to the other, like a Myrac, you know, that that makes sense to kind of have those things. But I guess I just get concerned with just as an overarching principle that on the Minuteman bikeway, three to five stories is fine. So, does that, I, don't know. I uh, had a similar reaction, but I wanted to take a step back to sort of Andy's point, and I think that the presentation to the audience may be clearer if you find a different word other than quarter. Hmm. Uh, certainly for the Millbrook area, it's, 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 it's not, quite, you know, a straight line quarter. It's not quite so linear. It, it, the, the brook is certainly, but mm -hmm. the area around it that could be shaped as part of that area uh, does kind of expand and contract a little bit. Okay. The bike path is a quarter. Mm -hmm. But yeah. now, back to the streets, your commercial streets, you've got really two different quarters that you're putting under a larger umbrella of being a quarter, and that's where I think that the you may lose the public a little bit. Um, and there are a lot of similar themes that you're talking about with Broadway and Mass Ave. But I think you've, I've already said, there there's some nuances, there's some differences between the two of them. Um, on the question of height, um, and I, I think that uh, there, there are some people who have a knee-jerk reaction against mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think you really have to un make sure the audience understands step backs. Because a five-story building with a setback mm -hmm. looks like a four-story building from the street. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and on the commercial streets, I think that you could go to a four- to five-story pipe there, um, maybe with some variation. You know. um, but on the Millbrook and... Uh, the bike path, I think you have to be much more selective because one of the nice things about the bike path is there are parts of it, even though you're in a very, very densely populated suburban town, where you kind of feel like you're in nature. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. there's there's enough, um, you know, uh, landscaping on either side of it where you're not really that cognizant of the houses on either side, and that's kind of nice to lose that mm -hmm. sense of uh, urban density for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, then back to the Millbrook, this is a great area, I think, for, for mixed-use development. And here, I think, you know, we need to be flexible, but if everything becomes five stories in the Millbrook district, then we're losing something. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how do you keep those, those you know, older industrial-type buildings and do some adaptive reuse? How do you... Uh, integrate some newer features in a way that, that keeps that keeps a balance there. You know, that's I think the, the challenge. So and, and I think that you know you did say very building height there between yeah. two and four stories, which yeah. is good. Um, so I'm not saying it, it's gonna be uniform at two stories either, but you know, how do you get that mix that keeps it interesting, keeps it kinda you know kind of funky. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> actually, it, it, it's hard to regulate, obviously. Yeah. yeah, it's funny, when I was looking at this, I saw this picture, and I was like, thinking, like, they kind of got it right here in a lot of ways. They've got, you know, the, the, the water, the, the yeah. pedestrian bridge over the water. People love to Is get that to it. That's Greenville, South Carolina. Uh -huh. um, but they've got lots of light yeah, in the public spaces. Yeah. And pass it around. They've got oh, that's uh, very, very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's that's a much bigger town. It's a much bigger river than what we have. I'm not saying that's the blueprint, mm -hmm. but you know, the way they have managed to attract public, you know, the public there. But lighting is really good. Mm -hmm. Keeps you know safety. 
Um, they've got a mix of uses. There's an old cotton mill there that they've just left there. You know, um, they've got a hotel. They've got cafes. They've got a performing arts center. I mean, that's a dream. It's, bigger it's than a five. pipe dream. <laughs> yes. But but they, yeah, and they've got some tall buildings there too. But they've also got some low-rise buildings there that, that kind of keep things in scale. I think that's the the knee jerk on, especially the Millbrook and maybe the bike path too, is that right now there isn't the same accessibility, right? Uh, so all of that might make a ton of sense if it ends up being a public space like mm -hmm. that. But I know my concern would be that you put these design guidelines out there, people start building without providing that same public access. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then what you've got is you've got density, which is what happened, which is what has happened on the Millbrook, right, with those condos. It, it's, it's, you've got great height and you have no access. Mm -hmm. So all it does is deaden you know, what it should be a good yeah. resource, mm -hmm. I guess, so. And that's where I love where you put right. in the public realm interface. Yeah, I think that is so key. If we can stress that, okay. so, you know, I mean, where we do have setbacks on a commercial street, but it's a little, you know, uh, uh, you know, opening for a, a, you know, a public area, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. Um, and, and that's what keeps, you know, do you think it should start start with that, perhaps, and just in terms of the hierarchy, hmm. instead of leading with height, which is going to be fraught with contention? I think it's not a bad idea. I mean, especially if it's, you know, that the height is going to be subject, well, I don't know whether it can be, but I mean, you know, that it, that's dependent on this type of public realm interface, you know, that, that you know, you are rewarded for providing yeah. that kind of public realm. Right. Um, I, I guess that's what I would want. Incentivize. Incentivize, exactly. exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a, a greater, another story of, in fact, public access is integrated into this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. public, public access and public use, right? I mean, because I think just providing a doorway down to a path isn't... <laughs> Isn't too inviting. Isn't quite enough. Quite enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it isn't too inviting. Yeah. I think, I think really term. encouraging public character. It, yes, so encouraging. Yeah, yeah, public character. Exactly. That's a nice way to put it. I, I'm, I'm still thinking that this whole, that you start off saying the primary commercial industrial corridors of Arlington. I think maybe that's it. You've got a, the Mass Ave and Broadway are commercial corridors. The bike path is a park, which is, we're concerned about developing around it. It's a transportation corridor, so. Yeah, but just be aware of that, yeah. Uh, but I would, it's a transportation corridor, that's true. <coughs> but if you start treating it like a street, which is what everybody's going to understand you're doing, the way this is written, I think you, you may lose the primary aspect. It's a very unique transportation corridor, which is, it acts like a park, it acts like a recreational zone. There is some transportation in there that's workmanlike transportation, I, I, I got that. And then if you look at the Millbrook zone, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole area, it's a whole, it's not a street, mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily a park, it's a mixed use zone, it's an it's a, um, opportunity zone, whatever the word is you, you got for it. That's that's nice. Nice. That Somehow, if you can define it that way at the beginning, so people don't immediately say you're just jamming in heights, and mm -hmm. because those things actually may be perfectly valid in a way, as right. you start getting into it. Yeah. But if you look what you got right now, you'd have three to five on Broadway. I'm sorry, on Mass Ave. Kind of orienting that way, and then you so you three to five, and then you slope down to two as you got to the Millbrook. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have two across the way, and then you get to the bike path, and something would happen. I don't think you can really even look at it. It's hard to look at it that way. Well, it changes too, right? Because at times the bike path is lower, and at times it's higher. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. the it's so unique. Yeah. It's so unique. It's an opportunity district that it's hard to. I'm trying to figure out because I just picked this up myself. I didn't get a chance to look through it too carefully. How you how you take advantage of that? How you define design standards for a zone that cuts through so many parts of the center of our town. It's a node connector, it connects, broad, it connects the heights, it connects the mass of the uh, center of town, Arlington Center. Um, it has the bike path in it, it has the brook in it. 
it's that's what that's my, that's my problem. It's, it's immediately I said, oh, just this, you can't put a formula on this. I don't know whether I want, like you said, the different grade issues, um, where we built uh, where, where where we permitted 22 mil. Now that's a big gully, right? So they have their parking way down low. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So if you're at the bike path, you're still pretty high. You know, you might be three or four stories there. The feel of it. Right. Then it steps up into Summer Street. You would have to look at that. We did look at that very carefully, you see. And we tried to figure out how to, how to pump mixed use into it and how to, as, as, as an overall zone. So it's got medical office, it's got shattics, it's got the new retail, it's got the bike. And then we had them renovate the uh, pocket park, which was part of town land on the Mill Brook. If we had done even better, we would have had some other connection up onto Broadway so that we would have had all those things packaged in the idea of a mixed use development in the Millbrook corridor. That's the problem I'm seeing with th this way of defining it. Mm -hmm. These are really good guidelines, I get it. And they're, they're a good start because you know it, it tells you that you're going to have more density in, a, in an intelligent way. But I don't see how it works yet for that corridor, for the Millbrook corridor. I just, uh, well, maybe, maybe, that's maybe very, it does. That's a very good point. And uh, as much as I'm compelled to try to simplify into these three themes, and we're not married to it, I think it needs to be. Uh, my, my fear is that it is too formulaic and it's too blunt of an instrument for something that has so much nuance. Mm -hmm. So either we need to pull out the notion of the transportation corridor as a bikeway, the Millbrook has a potential public space yet to be developed, and then Mass Ave, which is clearly its own animal. Uh, maybe. Yeah, you, you, or maybe if you want to keep this formula, you introduce it, like uh, someone was saying, somehow you, you characterize the, these corridors. These are two major streets. Mass Ave is one of a kind, yeah. killer retail street, yeah. or commercial street. Yeah. Um, Broadway is is kind of our own local Mass Ave feeling. It doesn't go through every street, but it well actually it does. I, I take that back. It's similar. You're right. It's similar to Mass Ave, but it kind of has a transitional feel to it. it goes back into the neighborhoods a little bit more, and that kind of thing. Um, then you've got this bike path, which is a completely different idea than those two, mm -hmm. and then you've got the Millbrook Quarter, and then maybe if you characterize this thing first, yep. such that when you get back into the boom, 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 you already said, you've, you've added some caveats or you've added some descriptions, so then you can say, okay, yeah, well, I get it. I, I generally want there to be the ability to have higher buildings in these areas, more dense buildings, but I'm not reading it as a formula for actually building in those areas necessarily. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. I mean, someone's going to look at it and say, okay, I got a three to five story building around the bike path or around Millbrook, and that doesn't, I'm not, that, that doesn't make sense for Arlington. That's, that's, I, I'm scratching my head as well. <laughs> it's not easy. But that's, that's when I first read this, that's the first thing I thought. First of all, I couldn't even understand what Millbrook corridor was. Because once you actually draw a map of it, it ain't going to be a corridor. It's, moving around. I don't know what everybody else thinks. I bet you guys have had, will have a lot of thoughts about it. And, and some thoughts about why it's in this position right now. Maybe there's, maybe there's a way out of it. I think one thing we might want to do is to start by just pull, pulling the map out and breaking it down into subsections. The map of the Millbrook corridor, the Millbrook study area. Yeah, I mean, I think that one's going to be your toughest one because yeah. it's mm -hmm. such a blank canvas, mm -hmm. you know, that I don't think anyone knows what's possible. You mm -hmm. know? And it's almost, someone said opportunity zone before, so it is, it is more of a, you know. Right. Uh, well, it's by far the most variable because it goes from being an, almost in a natural state to a very industrial industrial state, yeah. you know, channelized yeah. it hard, soft, almost glaring transitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is a very special place. And there is a lot of history throughout the Millbrook study area. Um, some of it's invisible. The um, five defunct mill ponds were in mm -hmm. that area. But that pro provides 
some possibility for uh, interpretation and design, I, I think, because of, that works could work into the, um, I'm just thinking out loud, I haven't thought of this until Andy um, made, made this point about it's not being a quarter, but the, there are some historic resources that we could, um, we could build on for inspiration for site design. We could use them mm -hmm. to inspire site design. It's also possible that the mass of guidelines could be tighter, more specific, and as it moves to Millbrook, the language is just more flexible or mm -hmm. more malleable with the caveats that you had mentioned. I think it's, it's possible to lead with the aspirational components yes. and then be more, uh, provide more of a range in terms of things like distance, mm -hmm. percentages, heights, mm -hmm. um, because there aren't really clear and definable sections because the section changes. Mm -hmm. Mass Ave, it's really, it's at grade, it's, there's a public interface, it obviously has the highest amount of transit, so it may be possible to toggle the amount of tolerance that we use in our language to provide that flexibility. Mm -hmm. I think so, because I think if you, and I don't think this is what you're saying, but you know, I fear cutting it up into chunks and going with different things for different chunks, you end up with something that looks like that all of a sudden. And I know that's what, not what you're saying. I was saying, only but saying to cut it up to do the analysis. To, to, to figure out what and then could make sense. out whether yeah. there is anything common right. among the chunks. Yeah, gotcha. I agree you wouldn't gotcha. want to have that many different types of approaches. Well, maybe not that many different types of approaches, but not just one approach for the whole Millbrook yeah. area either, I think, because, you know, the areas where it's, uh, the brook is still in a more or less natural state, state <laughs> we don't want to lose that. I mean, we don't want to say, okay, maybe that's it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the other areas where there's either a historic or active industrial type of use, how do you, it's sort of, reintegrate that in, into the public realm a yeah. little bit and saying, okay, we'll let you build here a little bit more, <clears throat> but, you know, there's got to be something coming back in terms of yeah. getting people down to the, to, the, to, the, to the brook, building in a restaurant space or a cafe space or, or a, a walkway along the, the brook. So, you know, maybe the, the part of it is to try to, and, and I know that there's a property rights issue here, but how do you get like walkways along the brook? Yeah. That's, that's certainly interesting because maybe what we do is it's not the three corridors, but it's the types of places, the recreational uh, parks as a theme. Mm -hmm. And that applies obviously to the bike path, but also maybe other instances where that happens as a theme. And then there's the industrial uh, a waterway area theme, and then there's obviously the primary commercial corridors. Maybe we don't mm. so explicitly describe the geography, mm -hmm. or or the the name. Maybe we don't name it so much. Yeah. 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 I'm also just yeah. thinking about yeah. 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 more generic spaces, some space types. I think so people right. would be more comfortable with that yeah. because yeah. they'd be more familiar. Or when we when they we were looking at that corridor, and you could see the shape of it right in that. Yeah. And you start from um, Arlington Center, and you've got, it's, it's everything about Arlington, all somehow sequentially happening. Number one, you get this civic zone, the little street that empties out onto Mill, it's got the historical, it's the civic, it's the old town, it's got the little alleyways, it has that feel of like um, an old city street tight city streets. In fact, they are tight city streets with some of the stone and granite that you still see in some of the old houses all tightly packed. Then you go across Mill Street and suddenly you've got this beautiful brook feeling that you could be in somewhere in Vermont or New Hampshire with a, a beautiful thing next to 22 Mill and the bike and the pocket park. And, and that street, which is Millbrook Drive, is this beautiful little street. I mean, it's sweet with trees on both sides and the brook running along. Leads into the high school, that's a special thing, okay, <laughs> or it goes under. Mm -hmm. Then you get to Grove Street, and at Grove, uh, you have a little bit of that industrial feel because of the, uh, of the buildings around the inspectional services area. And then you you're, have a park zone where the tennis courts are and the 
the bridges that's dug in there deep. So it gets a little more parky and public park-like. And this, this isn't even mentioning how it, the, the bike path is moving. You're always seeing these cool cross streets that yeah. end in green bridges that are the bridges that were the original rail lines. They are the original rail line bridges. So there's this historical thread moving through it. Then, then you're in an industrial area, that, uh, not a, a residential area, I should say, very much so, till you get to the other side of Dudley, which is Brattle. And at Brattle, you're about to go into a whole other world to the, to the uh, east or to the west of that. But Brattle's a major corridor because it comes up and ends at Brattle Square, which is kind of a, an intermediate between uh, Arlington Center and Arlington Heights. It's like we even developed that in our ARB did in the early days as kind of a little mini center, an intermediate center, an intermediate node. And um, each time you're, you're, you're going through the bike path, either you're going through it, over it, under it, in some cases where there's a bridge, and you transition your way up, and then you get up to the Myrak area, which is just a great opportunity because it borders on the historical and industrial mill zone. Those, it even says there are mill buildings there. Those should be preserved or played off of in some way. The smokestacks way down on the other side of the colony development, but it still forms a kind of a, a bookend to that yeah. Myrak stuff. So yeah. that's a real opportunity to kind of keep that industrial feel going, and those could be quite dense, mm -hmm. and the, the mill might be something quite different there, mm -hmm. the, the brook might be mm -hmm. very different there. Mm -hmm. Then you work your way into the, into, uh, I always think of it as Anna, Annie LaRoyer's neighborhood, but it's, it's the <laughs> beautiful little residential neighborhood. There the brook is just shooting right through residential. It's probably going to stay that way. And then, and then you, you emerge back out to the, um, you know, gold, uh, gold gym, and then eventually across to the uh, hardware store. And that gold gym is a huge opportunity. That's where you really have a lot of flat land and maybe even some new industrial uses that can come in there. There's a lot of room there. Meanwhile, the bike path is crossed through it. So it's, it's really a series of zones that are characteristic of Arlington, very Arling Arlington-ish that only we have, okay, because we're an old industrial town that was on the way between here and there. And we used to have a, we used to have a recreational component to us, but we were always, I mean, there were like 60 mills or something on this thing, and they've got the history of it. So it's, it's not, that's why I'm saying it's, it's, a, it's a series of deeply rooted Arlington ideas that can then be brought into the future in a more mixed-use way. So that's why I mean, nothing's perfect, but the 22 mil chunk, in a way, was a pretty good characterization. I wish it had more industrial in it, but it has office, residential, park, connections, bike path, improvements to the bike path. I wish it had a connection up to Summer Street so people could get through. People talked about that when we were doing the, when we were doing the, uh, special permit, and they can get that way because they can go to Summer Street, but it would have been cool if there's another connection. So that's the, that's the thing I'm trying to see how we could capture in that, mm -hmm. or allow, as you're saying, to be captured without characterizing it in a certain way that it's not going to, it's not going to, people aren't going to not understand what the opportunity is. It's an opportunity for mixed use in a lot of different forms where they're characterized by Mass Ave, the bike path, the Millbrook, and Summer Street. That's what that's what worries me about the formula of it as a mm -hmm. corridor. Okay, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. David, I think you're onto something. Yeah. You said uh, a few minutes ago that uh, you know this is an example of what the commercial streets would look like. This is an example of what a recreation zone would look like and so on, without necessarily kind of get down to specific areas on the map. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but but you could say, like for example, on Mass Ave, you might have, you know, this type of building here. Um, I, I think that might be a, a help in the presentation. And 
I really like a lot of what you've done, by the way, because I think, you know, where's the tendency when you're getting reaction? It sounds like... No, this is great. It's critique? I mean, I mean, I mean not, it, 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 it's... It be negative it, at all. Not at all. No, no. Yeah. no it's, um, it's really because very important. I, I think it's really helpful to get better illustrations into our zoning bylaw, which is sort of ultimately I, where I see this kind of leading. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the illustrations of, of what step back looks like the illustrations of, you know, bringing the, 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 you know, the zero setback line in the commercial district is great. Um, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of great stuff in here. Should there be a definitions section where, even I get confused sometimes, step backs and setbacks because they sound exactly it's, like, but they're different. Yeah. Maybe we need a little definition. Oh, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. You say setbacks are ground level and right. stepbacks right. are, you know, yeah. third or fourth. It's stuff. a chance also yeah. to just reiterate the power of stepbacks and minimizing apparent height. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. just well, well, this this may be the way to go because as soon as you draw it on a map, then it's someone's not on the map, <laughs> right. yeah. or, or the line intersects two properties because someone's actually going to right. investigate it. So mm -hmm. it, it could it, it could be an intelligent way to sidestep the dilemma of showing exactly where it is while still maintaining flexibility of, of these overlapping yeah. geographies, areas. which yep. as you, you know, I think very well articulated, that's the complexity here is that there's no single line right. mm -hmm. like at Mass Ave. I mean, that's the only right. Broadway. Broadway is, uh, Mass Ave is easier to define. Yeah. The way you've done it. But even that, it's going to have holes where there are parks, like uh, Jason Russell House. Mm -hmm. it's, if you, I know in your turn, if urban design, you're leaving the corridor, and then you have a break. And in Arlington, it's lower scale, even in Cambridge in that area. So mm -hmm. you're going to have parks and breaks and things. Mm -hmm. As you get to the nodes, it gets more dense. As you get between, there are more breaks, like the high school and this and that. There are good areas to infill, but it's not always going to be quarter luck. And I think that's okay, the way you're handling that, because okay. I don't think people will say, well, I want to have <clears throat> five stories or three to five stories everywhere. We don't want that. We are allowed to have that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be, it gives us the opportunity to create density in those, particularly in those node areas. Uh, if we want to, which we do, because we think it's going to be healthy, it's going to be vibrant, and so forth. More opportunity for residential, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't mean we have to, right? Certain areas we want to keep open. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way they, they feel. That's easier, I think, to handle than, than the whole Milbrook Court. <laughs> I think I've said a couple times. I won't beat it to death, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to deal, that one, deal with that one. Well, let us chew on it for a little bit. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's, um, that's good advice. You can get up past the Arlington Center, and it's it's a reservoir. It's a fantastic uh, uh, asset for the town. If you ever go up there, it's like you feel like you're out in the middle of nowhere, as you mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Uh, it, it's occurred to me that it um, bears saying that it's not clear yet. I don't think it is to anyone, <laughs> at least it is not to me, whether these would be by right yeah. administered mm -hmm. at the building department or through a special permit process or through a new process yet to be determined that this is more ask. like site plan mm -hmm. review. We don't have site plan mm -hmm. review at this time in Arlington, but maybe that's what it would take. Um, so I, I don't want any um, misunderstanding or mis um, misinterpretation of assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That remains to be seen. They would, at a minimum, be used as guidelines. Mm -hmm. at, um, they could eventually, and should eventually, I believe, be worked into the zoning bylaw uh, to be explicit. But whether that would be like a special permit by right or something new, that's not determined yet. But don't we all? Don't we almost have to deal with that? Because this, as it currently stands, wouldn't be allowed under the bylaw, essentially, right? I mean, as it as it's currently set forth. In some places, it might. It might. Yeah. Correct. It, it it might be, but there 
I think that when we get a little closer to what the con settling down on agreement of the content, I think we then have to make some recommendations, the board will have to make some recommendations about how to use these on an interim basis and then how will they work into a zoning bylaw amendment. Mm -hmm. how, how you then interact with the implementation yep. committee and get them right. implemented. Bear in mind that this was a recommendation. These are three very different things. The Mass Ave Broadway, Minuteman Bikeway, and Moonwick. Do you introduce them as such? That, that's maybe I'm just reiterating. But that gets you right away off. And, and why did you choose them? Well, because there are three key things in the town. And you chose them because they're completely different. Because we could add in a couple more streets that are a little bit like Broadway. Yeah. We could add in some more parks that are a little, you know. But you also, chose those three because they're key to the town. And because it's really important to create connections between those three. Wherever that the opportunity arises. That they connect the town to its center. That becomes mm -hmm. part of the introduction to this thing. Yeah. So if you have a guideline, yeah. saying, well, wait a minute, I, 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 have you guys really thought of it? And now I'm talking to the, the prospective special permit guy. Have you thought about the relationship of these three things? Well, that's part of our guidelines. You've got to think all three, think about all three. So in, in a way, it plays into the idea of a guideline to look at them as that's pretty good. three different things. So the 22 mil would have looked at connections first as opposed to uh, it, would, it would include all and that. Halt, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a tough task you've got here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, uh, we love it, actually, because I think that in the absence of having guidelines, then there's no clarity of expectations. And so, as Carol said, I think this is going to be a process of, of a transition and as a first step to clarifying language and demonstrating ways of thinking as much as uh, I don't know how tall a story is. I, that's, that's really the goal here. Um, so. That might be a good transition just to show you some initial concepts for one of those sites that intersects two of the very different places. And uh, this was working with uh, the town about, it's, it's all the same site, so we've just generated a very simple SketchUp model uh, at the Walgreens site. We, we happened to walk there at the bus tour on April 11th when we had about 20 25 people or so, so we spent some time and people were batting ideas back and forth. There's always two images. There's an existing image and then a proposed image, and uh, this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of the impression of development, but what you're seeing here is a, is a I would say, an urban design aspiration for primarily a, a connection between Mass Ave to the bike path. There's Spy Pond in the distance. That's a a, a, a primary motivation. Another aspiration is that something that's very unique to Arlington, is, as you know, is the fact that oftentimes major perspectives along Mass Ave are terminated by taller towers. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so there's a notion that at the bend in Mass Ave, where the Walgreens site actually lies strategically, there could be greater height at that moment because you would see it coming west on Mass Ave, so therefore, you know, in this view, uh, the notion that, that that's a taller piece of park because it's on Mass Ave, but also it helps to terminate a view when looking down Mass Ave. So it's embedded in this are the number of concepts that we would use to describe why this took the configuration that it did. Uh, we also think it's just a What's that, David? What's this? Is this existing? Yeah, yeah that's, that's the back of it. That's exactly what it looks like. 28 feet tall yeah. wall. Yeah, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. So, look at that. you know, we're also suggesting uses here, as obviously the guidelines aren't necessarily dictating mixed use, but there's an embedded notion that mixed use is important for redevelopment. So you've seen a, a 3,000 square foot restaurant or something purple that just means it's a public amenity that would face the bipod. I think it's cool. Oh, wow. And also, you by putting the, the connection from the bike path to Mass Ave, yeah. you create an amenity for uh, residential, yeah. a scaled amenity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that the, the outlooks on that are marketable. Yes, it would for, be for the new development. So people, you know, that could be residential pieces or yeah. uh, 
whatever. This is where we would talk about setbacks, so actually the building massing tapers down as it gets mm -hmm. to the south because mm -hmm. you're closer to residential uh, areas on the side. Um, if you're interested in terms of numbers, what this results in is the current footprint of that building is about 15,000 square feet. Uh, we're showing blue for office, red for retail, the purple would be the restaurant, and then the yellow is housing. This gets us uh, uh, 30,000 square feet of office, 18,000 square feet of retail, uh, 18,000 square feet of housing, so that could be 20 to 25 units, 3,000 square foot of the restaurant, <coughs> and I should have prefaced this, this all relies on un essentially underground parking. It, it's built on a plinth because there's about a 12 foot grade change, so you could fit 90 cars uh, all together, 70 below grade, 20 surface parking, and, and, and the parking actually would then, uh, there are cores that for each of these three building footprints that connect to the underground. So it's probably more detail than you need to know, but we, we have So it would be an integrated uh, below surface parking. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Blue is office, office, right? Blue is office. Blue is office. Yellow is residential? Yes. Because you could also put your yellow back toward the corner and yeah. back to the uh, spot park. Yeah. yeah, and that would alleviate some of the parking burden because uh, the residential would require less parking than, than the office would. Put a little bit of, bit of it back there, but it could go either way. But at the tower, I get your idea. You're coming down, you're turning, so you're revealing that tower. And there's another one, by the way, which is the fire station. Yes. You can see from that point. Yes, right. Start to see from that point. So it's kind of yeah. nice to think of Broadway as, I mean, the Mass Ave is having these moments, yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. it always does turn. It's one of the most interesting things about it that that doesn't get taken advantage of mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of time. Yeah. These little rotation points. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I just I couldn't remember. So part of what we would do on in two weeks from now is maybe summarize the application of the standards, guidelines to a site that people may be familiar with and walk them through the process of how if a developer were to follow these recommendations, you might get something like this and why that should be tolerable. Yeah. You know, five. It's not really five stories all across Mass Ave. It's a range, and that's probably what a development entity would try to do. Mm -hmm. Or maybe multiple developers. Well, this, is very this is a really interesting yeah. example. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it, and and you know that corridor connecting to the bike path. I think that's 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 a great great idea. We, we worked with the planning staff on this. We had three variations of where that corridor would align, and we selected one that seemed to make the most sense given the site conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just think, such a bummer now that chain link fence and that. Again, I think that back piece leading to the purple might be residential. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to get retail back there. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. It's uh, It would be more like a muse, I think, is how we right. think of it, and that might not. We might not be ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the music. See, but well, that's what you yeah, have Arlington yeah, yeah, Center. It's something like that. Yeah, yeah. Our retail is not strong. They don't go off at Mass Ave. It's pretty big for news. <clears throat> as easily. Mm -hmm. um, David, one thing that you said to us at that meeting was that there is some engineering science behind five stories, that, that there are some. So you read this? Some um, a reason why developers like five stories that, that kind of made it worth trying. Can you tell? Can you say that again? What it was? Sure. You might be aware that you can still do the stick built construction. The five yeah. stories you can get on, on one story of concrete or, or concrete block, and then still build four stories of housing or office or whatever. Mm -hmm. With what what construction? Once you go above five, it, you can get around that, but you typically move into a different it's building. Too. Uh, construction typology, so there's fewer developers that would, you know, pursue that, and the site would have to be a certain size. So 
I honestly think five stories is certainly doable along that path. Um, we, we went back and forth about whether it should be four, and then maybe you get five if you have another connection or there's some other incentive. I, mm -hmm. incentive but um, it, it seems worth making the case, explaining that to the audience, that um, there's, there's a reason why five is most economically viable, right. and it doesn't mean everybody's going to do five. And if there's a huge outcry, we can say okay for but, but I, I think five with step backs is very different than five shear. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. yes. I think that's right. important. Right, and there's things to do to mitigate. Yeah. yeah. And that's where it was in the past. So it's very important to get the step backs and the step backs all, mm -hmm. all glossary down. Yeah. So. Okay. But I think, though, you know, you're, 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 you're doing that good. 20 to 30 year out scenario. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think of what development pressures are going to be on the, the mass app corridor over that time, mm -hmm. and um, you know what 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 is tolerable from the town's point of view, but what also is uh, sort of recognizing an economic opportunity you know, where you sort of see you know growth coming down through North Cambridge and. It does, just because there's a municipal border there, by economics, it wouldn't stop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's there's a potential to capture uh, some of that the North Cambridge style development mm -hmm. just to move it down the street. And five stories would mm -hmm. incentivize people to do that. David, you're thinking that this would be active with a lot of door, with a lot of openings windows that that red first floor retail on yeah it's actually poorly represented i think that we should need to show that as more of a cream color because it would like to be plaza with terror you know it's a, it's spilling out from the buildings okay, that's ground right. floor yeah it looks like it's passive but it should mm -hmm. be more active than that yeah. especially yeah. since it's the same color as the one that you know we call him the boogeyman here. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. Now you you had showed us you're gonna you're gonna like paint it up a little bit, right? Right. So I'm glad you guys didn't focus on the architectural expression because it looks chunky and modern and all that. So we'll we'll have an overlay that yeah. uh, makes it more more um, benign or more uh, historic. And I mean, there's so many different right. ways that we can well. we can make the language look more modern. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll do that. But, and I think you could have, again, even the purple could be residential. If, let's say a developer came and said, I'm not really going to put a restaurant in there. Mm -hmm. I want to develop that whole piece. You should think about that. Though I like the aspiration a lot, but I think that would be cool. Well, I think as an example, it makes a ton of sense. It, it's you, tempting you, to put um, residential back there, and, and I wouldn't want to foreclose that opportunity, the view of the pond, et cetera. But to activate that with a, a public Oh, a destination yeah. to draw. Absolutely. Oh, it's, and, it's, it's awesome. Uh, it would bring people down that, that alley. It would also it. potentially bring people off the bike path. We have the parks right there, too. Right. right. And I, I love that I love wonderful it. area wrong. of the park. I love it. Yeah. But I'm just saying, when you, the rubber hits the road mm -hmm. and the developer <laughs> comes in, just be, be aware that the economics of even a, you know, a small restaurant is mm -hmm. a whole other ballgame. But it could be fantastic. Yeah, the, interesting, the interesting thing is you really just need two bookends. If you had a 2,000 square foot legal seafood test kitchen or something, and then up on Mass Ave you had something else, everything in between it could still be residential with stoops, and uh, that's a beautiful place to walk. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be all lined with retail and commercial yeah. space, because mm -hmm. that, that doesn't have very good visibility from the street. So. And they're going to want to be in Mass Ave. Yeah. If you had a legal test kitchen, you would want to be on NASA. Okay. <laughs> this could then be yellow. This no. be I, I like the aspiration, but it may be something else. I mean, mm -hmm. I could see wheeling and dealing that they put their public club facility there. So, but I, I get it. It's just I've done enough of this that I know what happens. When <laughs> right. They say, well, no, I'm in a restaurant. I'm going to be on Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. I'm not coming unless you put me on Mass Ave. Yeah. But the idea is fantastic, and I think that's the, it's great to have a beautiful muse with trees leading back and some kind of a more public, active function at the end that, that enlivens it and draws you in from the bike path. You 
could get a restaurant, that would be fantastic. Bike shop, another thing. Well, the big take, not to summarize, but the big takeaways for me is we'll rethink, we'll rethink how they're defined and, and try to tell the story in a way that resonates with people. I think that's really what you were doing is, is getting people familiar with what they have or refamiliarize them and then think about how these guidelines can apply to the, to the thought of these places as opposed to the actual, this address. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Um, maybe using more diagrams to explain the vocabulary for, uh, like on the outset. Um, we'll show lots of precedents. I think that's important. And I'd like to get that example of Greenville. Oh, sure. That's, uh, that's beautiful. And maybe some sections, because as you were describing it, the topography changes a lot. And so we'll try to, I don't know exactly how we'll do it, but we'll, we'll try to communicate the fact that those transverse linkages are really what so um, make it such a unique. And somehow, like you're saying, if you, some of these areas would be more about linkages and connections, and others more about street wall. Yeah. You know, I think also if, you know, we didn't talk a lot about parking, but in this example that you gave with the um, low grade parking, I mean, that's the only way you get that because it's costly is to have more height, more economic return for the developer. So that's part of the presentation, I think. It, you, it, if you're hitting resistance on uh, height, you say, well, we know there's a parking issue in town, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't have a lot of extra area. We're not going to have square miles of parking lots. <coughs> you really don't want that. You think you do, but yeah. you don't, mm -hmm. right? Well, and plus, we don't have the lane. <laughs> plus, you know, this is not the Burlington Mall. Right. Or you could stick with what we have, right? <laughs> um, but if you, if you want to turn this around and do something exciting like this, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to deal with parking below ground, and the only way you can get a developer to put that in is if they're getting returned by going a little higher. I like this, because you guys are thinking tactically <laughs> how, how, how people can uh, be less inflamed about mm -hmm. the, adding another story and why that would make sense. So are we thinking that we wouldn't use this as an example? Well, I don't know. The, the one thing I really like about this that it shows is the, because I think anyone who's visited knows this <laughs> to this. You know, I mean, yeah. it just kind of, you know, what you'd give for, for that difference would be plus the parking, plus, you know, there, yeah. there's major advantages. No, I too. think we, w I would like to Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't, the concepts are just too abstract. <coughs> yeah, and I think, yeah, I think, I think, you could, yeah, I, I think it is. And, and I think, you know, I heard you say this is really blocky and everything, but I wouldn't Disney World it up e either, you know? I mean, it doesn't have to be kind as of like it's clear that it's bricks it's with spires and, just you know. Just to show that it, it, density it, or, or it wouldn't prescribe blocky buildings. No, buildings. no yeah. correct. And, and I think image. I think from that perspective, yes. But it, so so I guess it's moving a photograph or an image of something. Yeah, 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 of yeah, like, something closer. Without having to design the thing. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I feel like this is shocking. I mean, the first time I went, I sort of went. Like, I, I don't. I think this has to be look a little softer. We we can do that and without making it too cartoonish. But I will say, my lingering takeaway from last summer's interaction with the public. We had about 100 people there. Was a, they, people are comfortable with a little bit more height, yeah. and b, some contemporary expression might not be a bad thing. There was more tolerance for difference, change, diversity, and it might have just been the people who were there, but. Not everything could be faux historical, and, and I, well, and also just to we go had that back, project a couple of weeks ago. That, that first, yeah, first but first. but even back to um, the property behind Twenty Two Mill Street that you were talking about, the first proposal that we got from the developer was, 
It was a, it was a, a colonial on a, on a grand scale, wasn't right. it, kind of? Or a Georgian? No, no, it was, it was, it was the high school yes. planted on top of this. Yeah, and, and then they came back with more of a sort of international style with the flat roof and everything, and it's like, yeah, okay. I mean, this has got a little more urban edge to it. You know, it's, um, it, we don't have anything really like that in our own And it felt more industrial there, a little bit more yeah. like the grain of the, you know, office environment. So I, I think... We, we urged them to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that... Um, and they jumped at it. Yeah, they were so happy about that. Cause <laughs> it was easier for them. To so I, I, I agree with you. I think that you know there's more receptivity to uh, a contemporary style building style than you might think. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll work on the architectural expression. Great. Right. Good. Good. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for your time. Awesome. Can we, can we you can, yeah. They're worse to hide them from people in Services and the director of DPW, how they feel about uh, possibly serving on this, and after discussion with them and with um, Chapter Lane, it's not as critical, we think, for a DPW director to be a member, provided that he's consulted with for the relevant uh, implementation steps uh, that have to do with public facilities or recreation um, within his department. So the director of infectious services is very important, I think, for um, uh, especially all of these zoning that mm -hmm. uh, we might be undertaking. So that change was made, um, and, and that's reflected in that first paragraph. Um, the other change was simply to make it clear that um, item four and five, it would be a, uh, a former member of the Master Plan Advisory Committee, two former members. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and we tried to clarify that throughout this um, list of ten people. One thing, though, that I really, I really want to. Um, this is the time where I, I want to make sure the board feels like this is a board, a, a development board committee. Um, there were some real strategic reasons why I drafted it like this because I think that this. Implementation committee needs to be broad and very representative of different um, sectors. Mm -hmm. So I really want you to think about this. So right now it's got a redevelopment board member that could be um, challenging because right now because um, we're a short one member for one thing. Uh, but I think it's important to try to get an actual member representing the committee in, in the first year. Um, once things are moving, maybe it's a delegate, maybe it's uh, someone from the community who will be your liaison, but I, I, I really think it should be a community development board man, uh, member. Um, so are there, is there anything about this composition that you don't feel comfortable with or you think should be different? 
So I, I think the challenging ones um, for me are four and five because it doesn't have a way of choosing who those people are, number one. It doesn't say who is going to you know, appoint them. And number two, how long does this committee live for? Because, you know, if someone rolls off mm -hmm. and maybe another former member of the, ma see, I, I don't I know I that can, four and five work. I, can, I think I can address that. I've envisioned that four and five, that the, the call for candidates would go out and the members of the Master Plan Advisory Committee who are interested would apply. And the board would make your recommendation on. But shouldn't we say that? Because I mean, we should say uh, redevelopment board appointed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not even sure we need to say former master plan advisory committee member to the extent that that's who we do. I, I guess I'm so. Do you envision this lasting about two or three years, six years, nine years? I, once again, if we if we limit it to only uh, you know former members of the MPAC, mm -hmm. is there going to be an issue at some point where there ain't none? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and then and then what do we do? Yeah. Um, I, so I think that this committee should have a life until the master plan is updated. Okay, and that could be ten, uh, five, five, ten years. You're supposed, yeah. to, I mean, you're supposed to update a master yeah. plan or revisit it every five years. I don't know that we would be doing the same scope of work five years from now as we've just undertaken the past two and a half years. But you would do when you do a thorough update, and the board could suggest a period for revisiting whether the master plan master plan implementation committee has affected as much work as it can and now it's time to update the master plan i think that actually should be in the scope for the master plan implementation committee to make a recommendation when the um, committee feels that it's time for an update yeah but that doesn't get to the second part of your question, which I think um, we can brainstorm a little bit and come to probably a, a range of possible solutions on how to make sure that we don't just like have two legacy members that are there forever. Yeah, I, I just think that we have to, I just think structurally it needs to have who actually appoints them to the committee, mm -hmm. who chooses amongst them. But in addition to that, I, I think I infer a point, I, whether you intended it or not, that if, let's say, um, Jane Doe and John Smith from the Mass Plan Advisory Committee are appointed to position to seats four and five, will they always be the only people from the Master Plan Advisory Committee working on this implementation committee? Or could one of the at-large members be right. one as well? Right. Maybe after a certain period of time, it's four at-large. Yeah, I, I guess that's why I was saying instead of calling them at large, which the town manager recommends for appointment by selectmen, I mean, if we think that it's the redevelopment board that's going to appoint these two, I guess I would say redevelopment board member, and then I'd switch around a little bit and say number two, redevelopment board designee, redevelopment or uh, appointee, redevelopment board appointee. For items um, four and five? Or, yeah, and I guess mm -hmm. I, yeah, mm -hmm. items four or five, exactly. So what if we read, if this read, former master yeah. plan advisory yeah. committee member selected by the redevelopment board, mm -hmm. and then I think that two, two things come to mind. You could have one or the other of four <coughs> or five um, resign, or that, that could be a fixed term after which they are additional at-large members joining nine and ten as at-large, but appointed by the ARP. Yeah, and, and once again, I, I'm just doing it just so it can live forever without us having to do anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think once again, I, I would opt for four and five being redevelopment board appointee, preferen preference to former master plan advisory committee member. Okay. So that way, we have a preference. We're, we're obviously showing what we want to do. 
we know the spirit of it. But frankly, if this board decides that those folks are out of town, what, whatever this board decides, we should be able to appoint those two people mm -hmm. as as they happen, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That that's my view of the I stopped talking at this point. What's CBA? Uh, the community preservation act. The new the new CBA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's no member of the of you guys from the planning department? No, staff generally speaking shouldn't be voting members of a uh, board or committee or commission in my professional practice. experience I think. Mm -hmm. You you will get staff support. Mm -hmm. I mean this committee plenty of is, opinions. Yeah. Plenty yeah. Of opinions. <laughs> yeah. I'm confused by the second sentence in the first paragraph. So this says the committee would be appointed by the town manager with the exception of two at-large members who the town manager would recommend for appointment by the Board of Selectmen. We just massaged that. Yeah, but, well, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but to me it looks like the only appointee of the town manager is two, and then his recommendations in 9 and 10, mm -hmm. because you've got a redevelopment board member and I suppose one step removed all four of us anyway are appointed by the town manager but I don't think that's quite mm -hmm. what you're what you're getting at for this right. new committee um, and the director of inspectional services is not at that point so that's whoever's in that in that position. job in that position so four and five would be the ARB's appointees mm -hmm. Six and would six be the moderator. Ten, the moderator. Seven would be coming by vote of the finance committee, and eight by vote of the CPA committee. So, I just think you need to look at that second sentence again in the introduction, introductory paragraph, because I, I, I think that's at odds with the numbered uh, section here mm -hmm. in the middle of the page. Yeah, I, and maybe that I'm we not sure just you strike need that. everything yeah. up to yeah. um, staggered, but leave somehow um, staggered appointments. Yeah. Or maybe not, because the next sentence for non-staff committee members expresses that they would be staggered. So that sentence maybe we can just delete. Am I right? I think you are. Yeah, or you could just say the committee would have staggered appointments. Mm -hmm. okay. You could simply make it That's a better. very declarative statement. Um, and I. I think, I, I think we might be disappointed if you don't say town manager or his or her designee. Mm -hmm. uh, and item two? Yeah, and item two, because if he wants Andrew to serve or something like that, I mean. And we should probably, correct me if I'm wrong, make seven and eight explicit, or, or let them determine how they want to choose those, their representatives. Mm -hmm. Should we keep it uh, flexible for finance committee? So say, or, or their designee as well? Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of, do we want to be prescriptive about oh, how no. they would yeah. select their member? Yeah, no, I think it's up to them. Yeah, okay, so, so we'll leave that as, as a seven and eight. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, this is good. I'm glad you're being deliberate about this. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you is um, we speak about terms above, but I think we do want to add um, beginning with the end in mind. So we talk about when we should be more clear about how this committee ends. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that should probably go. At the end of the first paragraph, I believe, after the word facilities. Mm -hmm. So what's your thought? Is that a, a five I'm thinking year? five years. Yeah. Um, and then... Well, you see that at that point, point reviewed in five years? Reviewed, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, reviewed for possible disband... To either disband or... or or reconstitute or something like yeah. that, right? To, if there's reason to keep it going. 
Yeah. Would, uh, Who would review the board? committee itself? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The committee would provide the redevelopment board their recommendation, and the <coughs> redevelopment board would either extend or disband. Dissolve. Dissolve for the purpose of updating the plan? Or do we need to be specific about that? Um, be dissolved? Okay. Would either be dissolved or, or um, or reviewed or uh, that's what I mean. extended. Okay. And would it be implied that the standing, the then standing members would continue? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or whoever's got term. Extend for an additional term not to exceed another five years. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Where are you putting it through right after this new sentence? Uh, yeah, so I've got your turn. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the committee, the, it's five years, uh, the term of each person. So. Initial five year term of the committee, it would, it, it shall report to the ARB with a recommendation that the committee either be dissolved or extended for an additional mm -hmm. term, not to exceed five years. You're conveniently writing this down. I am. Yes. In such case, all then serving members would continue their current terms. Continue their current terms. I didn't get all the other changes, Carol, but I can get you that okay. and um, a couple of other things I took notes on, but I don't uh, profess to have all the changes that we I think I have the rest. Okay. Okay. Anything else about it uh, incomplete or missing or... No, I think that's the right word. Okay. Myself. Mm -hmm. Could you also send this to me, though? Sure. Um, because I think we just got the handout at the beginning of the meeting tonight on that, so that way they can just... Sure, well, that would be great. Yeah. yeah moving on to minutes. First from May 11th, 2015. A brief meeting prior to town meeting. I can only comment on the fact that I arrived at 7.59. That is true. Breathlessly. I'm, I'm fine with these. I second. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. May 18th. I had two things. On uh, first page, paragraph in the middle of the page, in the middle of that paragraph, uh, it says that I suggested one member could be appointed by the selectmen and approved by the town manager. And I think we've switched those. It should be that one member could be appointed by the town manager and approved by the selectmen. And then on the second page, second paragraph, that uh, one sentence paragraph, Mr. Kerr asked if there was money set aside to go through the zoning bylaw and rationalize it. And I'm, I'm not sure, that may be what Mike said, and that's, if that's the case, that's fine. But is rationalize the word that we want, or is it reorganize it or revise it? I mean, rationalize means. It may have been the use of it, <laughs> the inarticulate word I use. Um, I'm not sure it's the wrong word, Mike, but I just, it's sort of... No, I know what you mean. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of... I, think, I thought that was 
you know, I mean, I it's guess you could say to make it rational is one sense in, of it, or to rationalize in the sense of, you know, not justification, but rationalization. That's where I, I want to kind of, you know, make sure that you don't sort of... You know, no, you know, no, no. All, so. all it meant, uh, it, it was to make it consistent. Yeah. I think is what it was meant there. So I think maybe that that's a better way to... Uh, I said I have to go through the zoning bylaw, and uh, it's kind of like rationalizing a workforce. Frankly, it's a little bit of a euphemism. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what was realigning. Yeah, realigning. <laughs> yes. That's a good word for it. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's downsizing. Yes. Yeah, so it was right sizing. Right sizing. <laughs> right sizing the bylaw. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was I was in corporate speak there most likely. So. All right. All right. Well, I'm fine with <laughs> rationalized then. So that's, that's that is the context. Okay. But um, uh, wait. What did I just say? I, I think I think we could change it to uh, revise. Um, but uh, revise for consistency. Yeah, because my recollection of the whole discussion was around, you know, or actually not even that discussion, but it was during one of the working sessions or something else, how we had talked about kind of bring someone in to, you know, make it easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. The fix-ups. Yeah, the fix-ups, exactly. So I have. And I'm good with them. All right. I have, I'm um, sorry, I just have a couple things. I'm absent. Do you have on May 18th? I was absent. Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, I, just a small thing on the first page. Um, historical districts in the seventh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh paragraph should be historic districts. Oh, okay. And on the second page, the um, third paragraph from the bottom, the last, second to the last sentence starts with the department feels. Mm -hmm. That's actually supposed to be committee. The department feels a committee would be very helpful throughout this process because the, the grant actually pays for a consultant. Um, and I believe um, the case was being made to have an advisory committee. Um, so consultant would change to committee and then finally um, the last sentence would be Ms. Qualls to review desirable representation to have on the committee for the housing production plan. Yep. That's all. I'll move to approve the minutes of May 18th as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, anyone have any additional business this evening? I have the two copies of the Mystic River Watershed Association lease for you to sign. I thought I brought them up. I'm sorry if you give me two minutes when we're finished. You were authorized to sign them at a previous meeting. Okay. I just don't yeah. want you to leave without that. No, I'll, please. I'll go down Thanks. and sign them. It's fine. I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.